Joy, should we start or? Um, wait. Okay. I'll wait for you to tell me, yeah? Okay. Many people can't join in at the same time. Mm, uh, I think we can start. Okay, great. Um, so I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Sujata Visaria. Um, I'm here at the HKUST. Um, and thank you for coming to, I think this is the fifth webinar in our uh, webinar series on community networks and anti-poverty anti programs. Um, before I introduce Erica De Serrano, who is uh, the speaker for today, I just want to make one announcement, which is our last uh, webinar is going to be with Marcel Fafchon. That was originally scheduled for the 26th of January um, by Hong Kong's calendar. It has now been moved forward ahead 24 hours. So it's exactly 24 hours later. In Hong Kong, it would be the 27th of November. And I think everything has been updated on our website and uh, Joey has probably sent you um, an announcement about that or if she hasn't then she will soon. So that's just for uh, a change that you might need to make on your calendar. Um, let me now move on to today's talk. So we're very happy today to have Erica De Serrano, who is an associate professor uh, at the Kellogg School of Management, uh, who has done quite a lot of work on um, community-based development programs, but also does work on financial incentives and worker productivity. And today she's going to be talking about social ties and uh, how they affect the delivery of development programs. So Erica, you have one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, if you don't mind, we are allowing people to interrupt with questions. You've been here before, so you know, but then uh, after it's over, if you have a little bit of time at the end, people might ask you more questions as well. Sure. That's great. Fine. Thanks. So thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm actually realizing in the title that I wrote January 2020 instead of 2021, so I need to get used to the new year. Um, and there is a small change in title, but it's exactly the same paper. Um, so this, this is a paper with Oriana Robin Imran, Razul, and Munshi Sulaiman. Um, so very glad to present it. So let me actually start uh, with the, you know, with the motivations. Uh, I guess as most of you know, um, since the 80s more or less, there has been a big shift towards the local delivery of development programs, of development programs. So what this means is that instead of hiring outside agents to provide a service to a community, NGOs and governments nowadays rely more and more on local delivery agents recruited within their community and who provide a service to their own community. And there are plenty of examples of these local agents. You can think of community extension workers, community health workers, loan officers, and so forth. Um, now, this, this localized delivery approach has become popular both because it has been um, considered as being cheaper but also potentially uh, more scalable than the previous way, you know, delivery uh, development programs were uh, were provided. And this is because local local agents typically have, are paid less, and they're also uh, it's also typically easier to retain them. But one thing which is obviously different. Um, uh, in comparing a local versus a non-local delivery agent is that delivery agents are embedded uh, in a community and so they're embedded in local social networks. And so to understand whether these localized development programs are successful, uh, it's crucial to understand whether uh, social ties, the presence of social ties with potential beneficiaries uh, improves or instead hinder um, the, the delivery of development programs. And I you have just a share question. It. Sorry, this is early, Perfect. but but uh, they're not just embedded in social networks, right? There are many other networks. They might. So, are you only focusing on the social, or yes, exactly. is that a broad term? So I'm going to talk about social ties. Let me, I'll be very specific about what I mean with social ties, but it's going to be basically, you know, whether people know each other, whether they talk about agriculture with each other. Um, so it's going to be mostly social ties. Yes. Uh, but you're absolutely right. There are all the networks. Um, I guess the focus here is really going to be on social ties. Um, so just generally, um, and I'm sure, you know, you all know this, this is this kind of, uh, you know, 
some of you have contributed to the, to all this literature, but generally there has been two views on social ties in local delivery. One which has been a more positive and the other one which has been a more negative one. So the, most, the more negative one is one related to the literature and favoritism that states that social ties between agents, delivery agents and beneficiaries can potentially increase uh, the targeting bias in the sense that agents may end up favoring their own ties, their own friends, and this can come at the expense uh, of the most deserving. So this is kind of the more negative view. There is also a more positive view, which is uh, highlighted in the diffusion literature, which states that uh, social ties between agents and beneficiary can improve and increase adoption. And this is because agents can reach more beneficiaries if there are no more people, and this can then facilitate diffusion of a technology of a, of a service um, in a community. So, th so to some extent, you know, there is this view that social ties can increase the bias, but it can also potentially increase coverage and adoption. And so what we're going to do in this paper is that we're going to design an experiment to identify the causal effect of social ties on both bias and adoptions. And so our goal is to reconcile these two views um, within the same setting. Uh, I'm going to tell you a lot more on the design, but just to give you kind of the, the summary here, we are going to rely on a key feature of localized delivery, which is the fact that all potential agents, all potential candidates for the delivery agent position live within the community. And we're going to leverage that by basically choosing the delivery agent randomly among a set of potential candidates. Now, this randomization is going to be useful because it's going to allow us to use the ties of the non-selected candidate as a good counterfactual for the ties of the actual selected delivery agent. And this is going to allow us to look at whether ties affect bias and adoption, and I'll show you how uh, in a second. Uh, generally, we're going to be interested in two types of ties. First, we're going to study vertical social ties, uh, that is social ties between an agent and the potential beneficiaries. So basically, whether they know each other, whether they discuss agriculture, because this is going to be an agricultural program, I'll tell you more, but um, it's really going to be um, looking at vertical ties, so again, ties between agents and potential beneficiaries, which have been analyzed more in the literature. Uh, but we're also going to consider the role of horizontal ties, so basically the connection between potential candidates for the position. In other words, the role of connection between um, you know, uh, the, the potential delivery agents in the community. And I'll show you that both of this will shape program delivery and both of this will matter. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to tell you more about the context and then I'll tell you about the, the design and I'll finish with the results. And in the results, I'll first present the results on the role of vertical ties and then I'll move to the results on horizontal ties. And if I don't have the time to do everything, um, you know, I'll, um, hopefully I'll get to some of the results on horizontal ties. That's at least my goal here today. So what's the context? The context is an agriculture extension program run by the NGO BRAC in rural Uganda. And the program has two clear goal, goals. The first goal is to increase the adoption of improved seeds, which are underused uh, at baseline in our setting, and to increase the adoption of modern agriculture techniques such as intercropping, land sowing, zero tillage, and proper weeding, which, has, which are also vastly underused. Now, the reason they're underused uh, it's kind of different uh, for seeds versus for techniques. So for seed, people tend to know them, uh, but it's typically hard to find them in this community. Uh, in fact, uh, high quality seeds are you know, almost not available. I think 8% of our farmers say that they are available in the community, so they're hard to find. Uh, and techniques instead are not used because they're vast and mostly unknown, with some of these techniques being most, more unknown than others. Um, the goal of the program is going to be to hire one delivery agent, and it's going to be one local delivery agent in each village. And just to be clear here, in the, in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to call the delivery agent the DA, so DA you know, stands for delivery agent. Uh, so they're going to basically hire one delivery agent per village, and this delivery agent is going to be tasked with two, um, two things, basically. They're going to train poor farmers in agricultural techniques. So they're going to provide information on these modern techniques. And the second thing they'll do is that they're going to sell improved certified seeds um, uh, to, the, to, to farmers. And just to be clear, these are seed produced by BRAC and certified. 
and they're going to be selling seeds, uh, both you know, both maize and and beans for self for self self consumption, but also a set of new marketable crops that should allow them to become more commercial farmers and to start selling some some of their their output. Um, the delivery agents are compensated, but their compensation is actually quite low. So the way it works, and this is typical with all BRAC pro, you know, programs, is that the delivery agents uh, earn a commission on each seed sale. So basically they earn five to 10% of the sale price. But because they don't sell that many uh, seeds, they actually don't make that much money. They earn roughly 3% of their yearly income uh, as a delivery agents. So this is just to say, this is definitely not going to be their main source of income. They do this, you know, as a part-time job on the side, typically they're, you know, these are commercial farmers who have a farm and, you know, they have a lot of land um, and they are delivery agents on the side. One thing which makes the job attractive is that they receive free training from BRAC once a month. And this is actually reported as the main reason to accept the job. The last thing I wanted to say here, and then I'll give you more details on the impact evaluation of this program, is that this program is supposedly an anti-poverty program. So what it means is that um, the delivery agents are asked to prioritize poor farmers when training and selling seeds. But this is difficult, this is obviously difficult to monitor. And as I'll show you, a bunch of these guys, a bunch of these delivery agents actually don't uh, prioritize the poorest farmers. Uh, but this is definitely an anti-poverty program. Can I, can I ask something, Erica, please? It on the previous slide. So they incentivize um, the sale of seeds, but they don't directly or indirectly incentivize whether they train the farmers. Is that is that correct? That's exactly right. Um, so the hope the is that they will they will just do that because they can. Yeah, exactly. So training, you know, it, it's hard to know um, you, because these are, you know, you need to monitor and obviously monitor this guy is hard. Selling is very easy to provide a commission. The way it works is that they basically buy the seeds from BRAC at a subsidized rate and then they sell it at the market price. And so basically they get the commission. So there is there is nothing that needs to be monitored in, you know, in selling seed. And so that's, that's the way they basically earn money. So I was wondering whether there, whether when you start using these better techniques that has any impact on your seed utilization. So could it be that if you use better techniques, you now need less seeds than before or more seeds than before? Yeah, so there are some complementarities. There are definitely complementarities yeah. now uh, with some of the techniques, um, and you know we discussed this in the paper. I'm not going to talk too much about the agriculture side of the program just because I want to get, but absolutely there are going to be there are complementarities with some, not all the techniques and seed utilization. Uh, and in fact, this is why they they kind of push the two things together. Um, um, so can I ask a question? Sorry, Erica. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm, I, I might have missed it here. So did these DAs have any special trait characteristics to begin with that they were chosen as, potentially chosen as DAs? Yes, absolutely. Actually, uh, while you, let me just do one thing, if you don't mind, because I see that my connection is slightly unfair, but I'm just going to turn quickly to my internet. Just give me one sec. Okay, I'm on my internet. Um, yeah, absolutely. And actually, I can tell you up front, but I'll, I'll give you the criteria in a second. So they have to be women. Uh, it's all women. They have to be engaged in commercial farmers. So basically, it's going to be elite women farmers. It's going right, to be... Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'll tell you exactly the criteria, but there are definitely criteria. And it's, this is going to be important for me in a second. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to be very quick on the program evaluation just because, you know, I have a limited amount of time and I, this is not kind of the main focus I want to, you know, this is not what I want to focus the most today, but basically I want you to know that this project is part of a broader evaluation which takes place in 120 villages in rural Uganda, 60 of which got the program and 60 which didn't. Uh, and we surveyed roughly 4,000 farmers at baseline. And again, two years later, we got really limited attrition and the attrition is balanced. And so we can estimate the program, uh, you know, the program on average, and we find actually that the program on average is very successful. So we see that uh, the number of marketable crops that the farmers um, end up using increases by 20%. And we also see an increase in the likelihood that they're involved in commercial agriculture. Eventually, we see that profits or yields per acre, actually, to be more precise, increase by 32%. This is really large. But as it is common in localized development programs, what we also see 
And I have the, all the results in that appendix table. I can show you them later if you're interested. What we also see is that this large average effect is actually concentrated on 20% more or less of the community. I mean, this varies from one village to another, but really it's concentrated on a few people. And uh, if you look at within village inequality, actually within village inequality in terms of profit per acre, for, per acre for instance, increases at the end lines. Uh, so this seems to suggest that, you know, people who are targeted for the program are a specific type of farmer, uh, and it doesn't seem to be those, you know, who start with a lower profit per acre um, uh, at baseline. You have lower profit per acre at baseline. This is one thing. The second thing we see is that there is wide variation in the number of beneficiaries and in the adoptions across villages. So basically, in roughly 40% of the village, the delivery agents just train no one. Uh, while in, in the rest of the 60% of the village, we see wide variation with some of the villages having um, a coverage of up to 60%. So some DAs are really motivated, some DAs are not. And so what we're going to try to do in this paper, and, and I'm sorry, I can't go into the details of the program and evaluation, we are going to try to understand whether social ties can help explain which and how many farmers the delivery agents treat. And by treating, I mean how many they train, and which do they train and how many they sell the seeds to and which do they sell the seeds to. Uh, and ultimately, our goal is just to ask, you know, our goal is to answer the question of whether social ties can explain bias and adoptions. And as I told you before, we are going to look at both vertical and horizontal ties. Now, uh, to get at the effect of social ties, you know, it's not... It's not trivial, as you, as you all know, because if you compare farmers who are tied to the delivery agents to farmers who are not, these two types of farmers are obviously different on many dimensions, and you can't make a causal, you know, you can make a causal analysis by simply comparing them. So what we need to do here is that we need to compare ties of the delivery agents for the, for the, to get at the causal effect of ties. We need to compare ties of the delivery agents to a comparable group of non-ties. This is going to require cross-sectional variation in social ties. Um, what this means is that we will not be able to use what a lot of the literature has used before, which is within individual variation in social ties. So a lot of the literature compares an a person, a farmer, at times in which they're connected to the delivery agents versus time in which they're not connected. So it's a within individual variation. Now here we cannot use this strategy because we are really interested in comparing ties versus non-ties at the specific point in time to get at the bias. So we're going to basically be able to um, create cross-sectional variation in social ties by randomizing the choice of the delivery agents. And I'm going to show you how we do this. But in practice, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to zoom in in the 60 treatment villages of the program evaluation. And I'm going to tell you the three steps we followed to get at this cross-sectional variation in ties. So the first step, um, is, is kind of obvious. We basically went into the villages, the 60 villages, in fact, Brack went into the villages, and we asked them to identify two eligible and equally suitable candidates for the, for the delivery agent job. Now, just to be clear, and this goes back to the question Kurska asked me, um, there are a number of eligibility criteria. To be eligible, you need to be a woman aged be between 24 and 45, engaged in commercial agriculture, owning at least one acre of land, literate and well-known in the community. And not many people have these characteristics. In fact, we see that in most of the villages, only two meet all character criteria. We, do, we did this in the pilot. So we basically asked Brack to choose two candidates, two candidates per village who meet all criteria. And these two candidates are basically two women elite farmers um, who are, you know, who are approached by Brack and his village and, who, and they make sure that they're interested in the job. Now, before we randomly pick one of the two as the delivery agents, what we do first is, as a second step here in the design, is that we measure ties. Um, more specifically, we measure two types of ties. So first, um, we, we survey a random 20% of the farmer in the village, and we ask them whether they know candidate one and candidate two, uh, whether they have ever discussed agriculture with candidate one, candidate two, whether they're friends or family member of candidate one and candidate two. So we have measures of vertical ties between each of our surveyed farmers and the candidates. And obviously at this stage, no one knows who is going to be selected and so forth. So there shouldn't be a bias in reporting in the sense. And if there is a bias, it should be balanced for the two, for the two candidates. 
Uh, on top of that, we are also going to measure horizontal ties. So basically ties between the potential agents and also ties between the farmers. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you more about this in the second part of the paper, but I just wanted to flash this out at this point. The third step is one where we randomize one of the two candidates in each village. So basically one of the two person is randomly selected as the actual delivery agent, and the other one is not. Um, selected as the delivery agent. So we're going to call the selected person the delivery agent and the non-selected person the counterfactual agent. So the DA is going to be the selected agent and the CA is going to be the non-selected candidate. So just wanted to flash this out because I'm going to use this a lot in the presentation. Now, this is going to be useful because it's going to help us divide farmers in four groups. There are going to be people who only know the DA and these are going to be 13% of the village. There are going to be people who know both, which are 55%, people who know only the CA, the counterfactual agents, and then people who know no one. Now here for the experiment, what we're going to leverage is variation between the DA ties and the CA ties. So basically here, we're really going to leverage variation by comparing um, this CA ties to the, to the DA ties. And the design is going to be helpful in a couple of ways. It's going to make sure that the DA and the CAs, so the two agents are similar to each other, but positively selected in the village. This is because of the criteria. But it's also going to make sure that the DA and the CA ties, so these this blue farmers and these uh, and this green farmers are similar, but for the connection to the right agent. Uh, and I don't have time to go into the balance checks, but we have very detailed balance checks in the paper where we do show that indeed, uh, indeed that that's the case. Uh, we're going to use this um, you know, in a couple of ways. The first thing we're going to use the design for is to estimate the effect of ties, of social ties on the targeting bias. And to do that, we are going to use a cross farmer variation in DA tie. More specifically, we are going to ask ourselves whether DA ties are more likely to receive the training and the SIDS from the DA than the CA ties. And this is going to be telling us something about the targeting bias uh, because the DA ties and the CA ties are, you know, observably the same at baseline. So, you know, if one is favored over the other, it's because there is a targeting bias and I'll be clear about this in a second. The second thing we are going to use is a cross village variation in the number of DA ties. So let me be clear. Here, if you compare different villages, so imagine this is village one and this is village two, conditional on the total number of exclusive ties, so it's conditional on the number of DA plus CA ties, the number of DA ties is exogenous. And so what we're going to use this for, we're going to use this to estimate the effect of one more DA tie on adoption. And more specifically, on the number of people trained, the number of people who received seeds, and ultimately the number of people who use technique and who use seeds. Um, so this is basically leverage across village variation. And again, I don't have time to show you the balance checks, um, but we can show that this is, uh, this is you know, these two types of villages are comparable in number of village characteristics. Okay, so I'm first going to show you the effect of basically this tie between um, between the delivery agents and the farmers um, on bias and, and, and adoption, as I just told you now. And then later on, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the role of horizontal ties. But I'll first show you really the effect of vertical ties, so the tie between agents and farmers on bias and adoption. Can I ask another question, Erica? Sorry. Yeah, um, of course. Why women? <laughs> That's a good question. This is BRAC. BRAC is, they're, they're, you know, they only hire women. In fact, in all that program, community health workers, loan officers, it's women only. Um, they think it's for gender empowerment. And so it's only women throughout. Yeah. But does it's, that not go oh, first? No, no, push. I have to say, I have to say, except, except the management, which is all men, actually. I have to say, <laughs> BRAC management is all men, but the frontline workers are all women. Yeah. Because I, I, I wonder, you know, majority of the farmers are possibly still men, right? Now, yeah. if it were India or some other parts of Asia, I would have said, you know, a woman giving people advice might not carry the same weight. I'm not sure, but there's a possibility, right? That, that never arose in your environment? 
uh, it's totally possible, but this is, uh, you, you know, it's not something, I mean, um, or, um, from the field, it doesn't, I mean, at least in Uganda, it doesn't seem that this is too, gender is too much of a problem. But, you know, I can't tell you anything right. more than what I think it is because there is just no variation in gender. It's something like it's all women. So, right. Uh, yeah. Um, I wish I, I could answer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm wondering about this word bias. So, basically, I think what we might find is that uh, the, the DAs will, will, will train or give advice or seeds or whatever to the people they have ties with, right? Differentially, yeah. over, more than they give it to the CA people, the CA time. Yeah. Now, if if you know, I have limited time or whatever, it's costly for me to train people, and somebody I know, the the marginal cost is just a little bit lower because I know this person already. Then, of course, I should go and I should train them first, or I should train them and not train the others. And then, you know, um, they're comparable anyway, right? The guys with the DA ties and the guys with the CA ties are observationally, I mean, because of the randomization, they're comparable. So what's the bias exactly? Yeah, so so that I'm thinking of two bias. First is whether you favor more your friends, but you know, you're totally right, you know, it may be optimal. Uh, then I'll actually go, I'll get into rich versus poor, and I'll, I'll show you some measure of misallocation in terms of profits per acre. So um, that's what I'm exactly going to do now, actually. Mm -hmm. So, but first, um, as you just said, I'm first going to show you that DA ties are targeted more than CA ties. Um, the, the empirical strategy is going to be quite trivial in the sense that we are going to randomize whether a farmer is trained or given seeds two years you know, after the introduction of the program on a dummy for whether the farmer is a DA tie. Um, and the omitted group is whether the farmer is a CA tie. Um, so here, beta is really the causal effect of social ties. And we are going to control for different, you know, people who are shared ties or who have no ties, and we're going to add fixed effects. And the errors are going to be clustered at the, at the level of the randomization. So here, you basically see the probability of being trained by the delivery agent. And as I show you, in, you know, receiving improved seeds or training, it's basically going to be almost identical. Uh, and we are going to compare CA ties and DA ties here. Now, just to be clear, a tie here is defined as someone who is either an acquaintance or a friend or a family member of the delivery agent. I'm going or versus or the, the contrafactual agent. So actually, let me be more specific. A CA tie is someone who is an acquaintance or a family friend of the CA only. A DA tie is someone who is an acquaintance or a family friend of the DA only, of the delivery agent only. And I'm, I'm going to show you results with other measures of ties. But what you can see here is that there is clearly, it's clearly the case that the DA ties are trained more. And in fact, they're trained 7.5 percentage more than the CA ties. So it's indeed the case that the DA goes more uh, to her friends or her acquaintances uh, than, than she goes to instead of the, the CA ties. Now, the effect on receiving seeds is nearly identical, maybe slightly, slightly lower. Uh, one thing I want to show you is that actually we can change the definition of tie. We can look at, we can compare people who are friends or family member of the TA only versus people who are friends or family member of the CA. Uh, and if we do that, the results are a bit stronger for training, but you know, no big difference. So in the rest of the talk, I'm really going to use you know, the first measure, which is more conservative, which is whether you're an acquaintance or a friend or a family member, but everything you know, works if I use this alternative measure of friend or family only. Something which is interesting is that when we compare people who at baseline only discuss agriculture with the DA to people who at baseline only discuss agriculture to, with the CA, and again, these two types of farmers are similar at baseline, they're similar, what we find is that actually, whether you know the DA or the CA, whether you know the DA doesn't really help that much in terms of getting training or seed, or at least it helps less than you know, if you're an acquaintance or a friend or a family member. So this kind of cast you know, cast doubts uh, against the interpretation that here the delivery agent is really going to target her friends or her acquaintances because she believes these people will be more responsive to the information they are going to give. If this was the case, we should find, you know, large coefficient here. Instead, we don't see that. So here there may be a bit of that. You target, you know, people you know because you think they'll be more responsive to the information. But there is also something about, you know, potentially it's less costly, or I prefer to target my friends, so I go to them. Um, 
One thing you may wonder, and I'm going to be quick on this just because of time, is whether you know the fact of getting more seeds from the delivery agents um, is compensated with getting fewer seeds from other BRAC sources or fewer seeds from non-BRAC sources. So maybe the, the, the DA ties are just substituting where they get their seeds. So they're more from BRAC, less from other sources, but we actually don't see this in the data. And ultimately, we see an increase in the number of techniques uh, this farmer use. They're trained more, and we see more techniques used um, among DA ties and among CA ties. Uh, the sample size is smaller here because actually what we did is that we went on the plot of land of the farmers, and we actually went and observed whether they did use the technique, but we didn't have the, the, the money and the time to do it for everyone, so we did it for a random subsample of the, of the farmers. And But we, we did it, so we observed, we also asked we also ask farmers to self-report whether they use this technique. Either way, uh, we actually find that the DA ties uh, use more techniques than the CA ties. We have a question. Sorry, Erica. Uh, Yong Hoon? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering about your interpretation because you're actually giving a lot of attribution to the DAs. I'm just wondering whether it's uh, the farmer's actions or their agency to go and receive these um, you know, trainings, especially if this training involves a lot of, you know, vulnerability in terms of, you know, making yourself uh, or admitting uh, that yourself is not so knowledgeable. So I'm just wondering, is that, uh, can that yeah. be possible, like that is embedded in the, the type of training they receive? Yeah, and it's absolutely possible, actually. So here, to attend the training, you need to be invited. Um, now, we actually do have data on whether you're invited and you go. So we actually know that I think it's 92% of those invited actually end up attending the training. But obviously, the DA may, may target people who they know will accept the training, maybe their friends or so on. So here, I'm really not going to be able to say, you know, uh, everything comes from the DA side. It can come from the farmer side. At the end of the day, you know, it's, you know, it, it doesn't really matter in a way. But, you know, you can think of both interpretation. Um, it's all going to, you know, to be part of the same story. But I can tell you for sure, you know, that it's, it, it probably comes from both sides, um, basically. Um, yeah. I don't know if Thanks. I'm answering you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So next thing, I'm just going to do the same thing that I did now, but now I'm going to look at targeting. At, and when I mean by targeting, I'm going to look at targeting by poverty and knowledge. So basically, I'm going to interact, uh, you know, whether you're a DA tie, uh, with some variables. And I'm going to look at whether the farmer is poor, and this is because it's supposedly a pro-poverty pro, 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 program, a pro program um, an anti-poverty program, I should say, sorry. And I'm also going to see whether the farmer has little knowledge at baseline. So basically, I'm interested in, ch in checking whether the delivery agents target more the poorest among their friends, and if they target more people with low agricultural knowledge among their friends or among the, the, the CA ties. Um, and this is basically what we find for poverty. Now, here in this, in this figure, um, a poor person is defined as someone in the bottom 25% of consumption. We can use different measures. Again, instead of consumption, we can think of assets. You can look at food, food insecurity. We have those as robustness checks in the, in the paper. But this is actually what BRAC used, so we end up using the same measure. Uh, and what you can see is the following. You can see that among the DA ties, the DAs actually target um, rich people the most. Riches me means, it's a bit of a bad word, but it means not being the top in the bottom 25%. So among their friends, they actually target uh, the richest, um, which, you know, to some extent, you know, again, is in line with homophily. Um, uh, and actually, this difference between the two is statistically significant, the 10% level. What's more, even more, you know, interesting is that actually what you can see is that they actually tend to prefer rich friends to poor non-friends. So this is really showing, you know, there is mistargeting in terms of this anti, if, if Brock really wanted an anti-poverty program and at least in terms of who they target, this is not what this, these delivery agents are doing. They're targeting basically rich friends over, over poor friends. The third group targeted is poor non-friends, and ultimately those who are targeted the least are rich non-friends, although these two are actually not statistically different. So um, question. Um, yes, uh, I mean, targeting may be based on some expectation of how people will react to the offer, uh, and therefore anticipated take-up is important. So <clears throat> they have better information also about 
uh, the French characteristics. Right. And so it, it, there are good reasons to believe that the wealthier farmers, the more landed farmers are going to be more interested in innovations. So it may not be the result of any bias on the supply side from the agent. It could all be a demand side effect combined with the information advantage of the agent uh, of the characteristics of his friends. So right. how, how can we infer this to be a bias? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I have one slide, one additional piece of analysis, which I presented in the next slide. And let me, let me tell you what I have in mind and let me tell you if this answers. Um, I'm trying to basically get that more at means allocation. Uh, but let, first, me, let me finish this slide just, just to conclude. But basically, you know, when you look at wealth, we can use wealth in different ways and we find this targeting. We find very similar pattern if instead of rich and poor, you divide between farmers who know little about techniques at baseline and farmers who know more about techniques. So in terms of the training, they seem to actually, um, they seem to train people who know more about technique at baseline than people who know less about technique, which may not be optimal, but again, you're right, it may, there may be a demand effect here. So one last thing we do in terms of, of mistargeting and misallocation is that we actually compare the returns to the program for treated DA ties to treated CA ties at the margin. So let me be, let me be a bit clear here. So at the social optimal, you would expect the returns to the program to be the same for all farmers. Um, and what this means is that you would expect uh, treated CA ties to have the same returns to the program uh, at the margin than treated, C, uh, than treated DA ties. So to look at whether that's the case, we basically compare the returns to the programs for treated versus treated DA ties to treated CA ties for different decile here, from the 10th decile to the 19th decile. Um, and one thing that we see is that at baseline, actually, treated DA ties versus treated CA ties are similar. In fact, they're similar along the entire distribution. However, if you if you compare end line, if you, if you look at end line differences between treated uh, DA versus CA ties, what you can see is that the returns to receiving the programs are actually lower for the A ties and for C A than for C A ties up to the 70th percentile. So what this is saying is that the agent can potentially increase output here by treating the same number of people, but by swapping a D A tie uh, with uh, uh, by swapping by, by swapping a D A ties with a with a C A ties again because if it was in a social optimum at the margin, both of these should have the same returns to the program. Sorry, I come back again with the same question. Yeah. Uh, so this could reflect differences in information of the agent. It, it, it could be even something more complicated than that, the credibility of the agent. Sometimes farmers are unwilling to listen to advice from others unless they really trust them or know them well. Uh, so, Again, uh, so this it could just reflect, you know, a lack of sort of the a lack of information and credibility as a result of a weaker link, and not necessarily the incentive of the agent. I'm trying. To, I'm thinking because I, I remember. We, so one thing I'm, uh, I remember we did certainly in the paper is that we did look at whether how receiving the training matches with adopting the technique. Uh, and, I, and there was no difference whether it was a DA or CA ties, but definitely one thing which is true here is that you know there is a selection of people who end up attending the training, and it's it's not the same for DA and for CA ties. Um, so, and I should have and I should have a better answer because I I remember discussing this, but I don't um, I don't remember exactly. Exa I don't remember exactly. I guess one thing we which can help, but I need to think a bit more because this is an important question. I should have an answer, but one thing which um, one one thing which which we see that I wonder whether this helps is that when we actually compare people who discuss agriculture at baseline with the DA versus people who actually discuss agriculture at baseline with the CA. You don't see any difference. So here the idea is that if you discuss agriculture at baseline, you're more likely to 
to kind of uh, trust uh, tr trust the opinion because you basically these are people who ask for advice is at baseline and if you look at the difference between DA and CA ties the difference are much smaller than if you look at you know acquaintances versus friend or family member so I guess uh, this is saying that you know if it was only a question of trust or a question of to how receptive you are to the information I mean this may be part of the story but it doesn't seem to be all of the story um, can I make a comment here um yeah, yeah. It seems like I think the results are clear and compelling, but I think uh, a lot of the discussion is about how do we think about the words bias and also the word misallocation. So you're describing this as misallocation, um, but relative to what kind of cost structure? And I think Dilip is pointing yeah. out that the information cost, the other things. I mean, so I mean, what's the counterfactual? How else would you deliver it if you're not going to pick an agent? And uh, well, I mean, you're looking at misallocation as, uh, oh, really, we really want to just treat the poor people or not bias it, you know, in ways that interact with social ties. But that may, that may be from one standpoint of the actual cost of the effort of the agent, it could be very efficient. It could be perfectly efficient in that sense. And so not a misallocation. So it increases inequality. It increases inequality on relative, on, you know, on margins that are not related to need or productivity related to social. That's all true, but you know, what is our definition of misallocation and, and efficiency here, and also bias? I think that's kind of what what's causing. No, so I, I, me too. Yeah, no, no, no. And no, 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 and I think you're you're right, um, and and uh, <laughs> you're totally right. And I guess I need to, my, my myself. I need to be clear. I mean, I need to be clear on this. Um, uh, I guess the, you know. Um, ultimately, I I guess the best the best for me to think about this allocation is this figure. Uh, but but I, so I think I agree with your comments, and I, I I feel like I should be clear in my mind. I need to think about this, and I think I need to be clear. In because the way I, I think Dilip is suggesting that if the Asian is is not really trying to be biased, you know, like outright favoritism, but the Asian is trying to be efficient in terms of using the information and taking advantage of the farmers who trust him in an optimal way, you know, not be, you know, you could get this result without him actually. He could be trying to be efficient, basically, not trying to be biased in, in terms of explicitly just favoring people. And so yeah, okay. in that sense, you know, why, why is it misallocation? Right? Yes. There's just one more thing. Sorry, but I want to I just feel like it's important to take note of the fact that the incentives of the agent are not aligned with with equalizing profits per acre in the village at all. Right. The incentives of the agent are to sell as many seeds as she can. And to the extent that richer farmers have possibly more land and are going to cultivate on a larger scale, they're going to buy more seeds. Um, yes, that's right. I need to get more into the details of, so basically uh, what you sell is a pack of seeds per farmer. So they shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the case that as a, you know, as a larger farmer, you buy more seeds, but definitely if you're a larger farmer, you, you may be more likely to buy a pack of seeds. Um, so I guess that's a possibility. But so I will need to get into the detail of how these seeds are sold. But I think ultimately uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. But that's that's absolutely possible. Um, can, I, can I ask one question? Uh, uh, yeah. So do, do what do they? So can the agents decide the price? Is there any way in which you can think of dispersion in price uh, as a way so, to? So. Uh, <laughs> Um, not really. So there is, for some of the seed, there is really a market price and we actually don't, we, we actually have data on prices and we see very little, so the, the conclusion that we see very, very little variation in the final uh, delivery agent's price. And we actually mm -hmm. see also very little uh, variation within the community. So, it, you know, the, and I, I should give you the price. The price are relatively reasonable. They're actually slightly before the below the market price, and they tend to follow. Brock has a suggested price, and they tend to follow that. Um, no, yeah, I, I was just saying that because if you if it's bias or if it's favoritism, they they may sell cheaper, right, to to their rich yeah, no, friends. Exactly. Uh, um, exactly. And then just like exactly. the other point is is I mean misallocation is a consequence of market frictions. And that could be a million things. 
uh, one of them may be favoritism. So, so I, I guess like what well, that's like the the bigger point here. To to which extent this misallocation, if we take this figure, is is biased or is it reflecting other type of frictions that may arise in the setting? No, no, I agree. So I think I, I fully agree on your on all your points. Um, so I think what what I can say now. Um, is that definitely you tend to go more to your friends. Uh, definitely you tend go, to go more to rich versus poor people. So if this is an anti-poverty program, they're definitely not following that. Um, whether this is efficient or not, so in, in a way it's a bias if we think of the anti-poverty program. But uh, if we think in terms of whether it's efficient or not, I mean, there is this figure that would suggest that, you know, you should have the same returns, but for, for the marginal DA versus CA type, but that's not the case. Uh, but I think I need to think deeper about your comments because um, eventually I agree with Albert and did it basically, it's a question of how you define basically the, the bias. Um, and I need to be clear. Uh, on that. So I'll think uh, about this and I have a good question. Let yeah. me, uh, can I just like throw a curveball uh, from a very different, I mean, coming from a very different background, but I'm just wondering like the role of, you know, uh, the criteria of selecting DAs in a sense that it seems like you're portraying the story as the DA is actually favoring rich. Uh, to me, it's actually DA favoring the C people who are in similar situation. In a sense that the EAs, the candidates of the, these EAs, like probably are more reputable, more elite, more rich. So yeah. it's not they're like uh, it's not like they're discriminating against the poor. It's more like they're just like uh, talking to uh, to their friends rather than they're uh, looking for their um, wealth uh, wealth uh, inequality or distributions. So it might be a bias, but I think it might be a bias toward like their own, you know, friends, but not on the wealth in itself. So. I just sure. want to throw that idea out, so because that was so uh, sticking to, uh, sticking into my mind. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Sure, sure, but that, that, that's totally right. Ultimately, they don't do poor, poor targeting. Um, I guess that was the point. But you're absolutely right. There is a mafia, and you tar you know, you go more to your friends and the rich ones. Probably those who are closest to you. So let me just move on because I am seeing that I don't have that much more time, and I have, I really want to show you the, the effect of horizontal bias. So uh, the thing I can do is to look at the effect of social ties on adoption. Um, and so to, to do that, I can regress the number of farmers in the village and that are treated and that adopt seeds and techniques on the number of delivery A ties, uh, controlling for the total number of DA plus C A ties. Um, and if I do that, basically what we find here is that an extra D A ties increases the number of farmers trained by 0.24. And it also increases the number of farmers who you know, are sold the seeds to, it also increased adoption, although the results are less precise. Uh, so what this is saying is that in a community, if you have more friends, um, you adopt. Basically more people are, are, you know, are treated and more people adopt. So, so ultimately this is saying overall, we see you know, that there may be vertical ties may lead to more bias towards your friends uh, and more coverage, uh, but also more coverage and adoption. Um, just briefly to conclude, it's really hard to know what are all the, the welfare implications for the delivery agents, um, because it's hard to know what what the what what do the DAs whether the DAs get favors back from you know their friends um, when they get you know when they get the training or the seats, um, and it's really hard to know because you know beneficiaries can repay in multiple of ways. But one thing we can do here. Um, is that we can actually um, detect the effect of, you know, the, whether the DA gets favors back by comparing the actual uh, wealth growth of the delivery agents between baseline and end line to a predicted wealth growth. And the predicted, to do the predicted wealth growth, we actually use hypothetical delivery agents in the control villages. So we identify who would be the hypothetical delivery agents in the control villages. We estimate what their growth is, and we use this as basically the hypothetical wave growth for the delivery agents, and we compare the actual wealth growth to this hypothetical wealth growth, and we see that the actual wealth growth of delivery agents in almost all the villages except, except two actually out, um, is higher than the predicted wealth growth. So this is just to say there seems to be the case here that the DAs do get favors back, uh, this figure is actually way stronger when you look at villages where the DA has many ties, more than the medium number of ties. Uh, but this is just to say that, you know, all this program seems to benefit basically the delivery agents themselves. 
um, wealth is measured with the number of assets, but I'm going to skip with the number of horizontal, with the rule of horizontal type, types, um, just because of time. Okay, so basically all the results I've, I've shown you now are going to be starkly different depending on whether there is a connection between the delivery agents and the counterfactual agents or not. Um, but theoretically, uh, why should the connection between the delivery and the counterfactual agent matters? I mean, it's because one should expect that if there is an horizontal tie between these two, uh, between the two potential agents, there may, there may be more favors exchange. What this means is that if you are the friend of the counterfactual agent, maybe you're not interested in favoring your own friends. You're okay to favor the counterfactual agent's friend as well, um, you know, because of favors exchange or because of other reasons. Instead, if you're the rival, if you hate the, counter, the counterfactual agents, like they, let's take this extreme, you may really, really um, favor your own friends over the, counterfactual, the, over the counterfactual agent friends. So basically the connection, the horizontal tie between these two potential agents can really affect the extent to which the vertical ties lead to a bias or lead to more coverage. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, show you your results using different measures of DA and CA tie, horizontal tie. So the first thing I'm going to look at is whether they're friends or family members, uh, which is the case in 72% of the villages. But another thing we're going to use is whether the DA and the CA have the same group identity. Now, why do we look at that group identity? Because group identity is a key determinant of social preferences. And here in the Ugandan context, one thing which is a clear reason for division is politics. In fact, an election is coming up in a few days in, in Uganda, uh, and politics is very divisive. If you ask people which, which group do you feel you belong to first and foremost, 95% answer you politics. So here, at the time the, 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 the study was taking place, there were two groups, you know, two political groups, and whichever you identify with, um, you know, it leads to a strong group identity. So here we're going to look at whether the DA and the CA belong to the same group. And because this is a sensitive topic, we measure it as self-reported, but we also have an implicit association test. And we'll have that roughly half of the villages, they belong to the same party, and in the other half of the villages, they belong to different parties. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to do exactly the same as before. The only thing is that we're going to interact DA tie so we're going to compare DA versus CA tie in villages where the DA and the CA are united. So in villages where there is a tie between the two uh, and in villages in which the DA and the CA are divided when there is no tie between the two. Now, we're going to include village fixed effects here to absorb correlate of DA CA tie. Uh, and we're also going to control for all the village characteristics we have available interacted with uh, DACA united and DACA divided. So we have first, for instance, we're going to control whether for village, for a number of village infrastructure variables. We also have data on political polarizations. So we're going to control for that. I mean, the goal here is really to make sure what is, you know, what is the difference between the effect of uh, DA, so what is the difference between DA versus CA ties in villages where the DAC are united versus villages where the DCA and CA are divided, holding a bunch of things constant. Because remember, whether the DA and the CA are united or divided is not random, right? So we're basically trying to control here for political polarization. And so this is what we find. Um, remember the previous figure, it was pretty neat, the, the, the CA ties were tr was treated less. Here, what you see is that all the results come from villages where the DA and the CA are divided. So let me be clear. In villages where the CA and the, the DA are united, here they're measured, it's measured with whether they belong to the same party. And I can use different measures of tie, I basically get nearly, it's nearly identical, I'll show you in the next table. What you see here is that if the DA and the CA are united, they belong to the same party, there is literally almost no difference in the likelihood that the CA tie is strained relative to a DA tie. Um, if you look at villages where the DA and the CA are instead divided, you see that the difference is very stark. Actually, DA ties are 10 percentage point more likely to be trained uh, than the CA ties. Now, there are a couple of things which are, which are interesting in this graph. The first thing is that, maybe this is expected, uh, is that 
When the DA and the CA are divided in the sense that they belong to different parties, uh, the DA is less likely to train a CA tie uh, than you know, when they're united. So you go less to friends of your rival when there is a rival. But what's interesting here is that you also go more to your own friends when there is a rival. So when there is a rival, you actually go more to your friends than if that rival is in there. So this is actually something, there is a whole literature on parochial arteries and on how you care more about your own friends if there is someone, you know, uh, someone from a different political party or, or a rival. And this seems to suggest this is the case. Um, so you go way more to, you train way more of your friends, uh, but you train, you, you kind of sh shun the outgroup. Um, nearly identical result if I look at C's. Um, now, what I've presented you is basically tie defined of same party. So whether the D and the C belong to the same party self-reported. We can use the implicit disassociation test is nearly identical. We can also look at friends or family member. It's quite similar. Although the overlap actually of political, political affiliation in friends and family is, is actually not that high. Um, so the two, the two variables actually pick up different things, but, uh, but the results are consistently saying that, you know, difference between the D and the C type exists only if the D and the C are divided. Uh, what we also see is that the number of D ties you have, so the number of friends you have in the community increases the number of people you train or the number of people who end up adopting the techniques or the seeds only if the DA and the CA are divided. So in other words, if you're in a community where the DA and the CA are united, how many friends you have doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter for how many people you train or how many people adopt, because at the end of the day, you have an optimal number, you go for that number, you just train regardless of whether it's a tie or not. But if you're in a community where the DA and the CA are divided, how many friends you have really uh, really increases how many people you treat. So having more friends in a community where D and D and C are divided boosts adoptions, but that's not the case if the D and the C are united. So just at the bottom line in terms of this, uh, what this is saying, this is saying that basically all the trade-off we saw, we saw in terms of vertical ties. So I told you before, vertical ties increase bias, but also increases adoption. All this seems to exist only in the subset of villages where the D and the C are divided. So horizontal type seems to matter, um, seems to matter in this set. Uh, let me just maybe ask, uh, so sorry, how much time I have, because otherwise I'm going to skip this last part. 15, um, 15 minutes. I still have 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. so I'll I'll try I'll actually quickly talk about the role of horizontal ties between potential beneficiaries. So um, what I showed you now, what I've shown you uh, before, is the role of horizontal ties between potential agents. So it's basically ties at the top. Uh, so among elite farmers. Now what I'm interested in is what the effect of horizontal ties between farmers. And this may matter because you know if farmers are really connected with each other in a community then you may have more information exchange. So people may exchange information. And what this means is that you may have more diffusion and you may have more adoption of techniques also among non-trained farmers. Uh, this is obviously the case only if you're in a village with high diffusion potential. So in a village where people, with, where farmers are connected with each other. What we're going to try to understand uh, here is whether the horizontal ties between farmers matter. And more specifically, we're going to ask ourselves whether the DA internalized diffusion. Uh, the idea here is to try to ask ourselves whether the DA decides to train more or fewer farmers depending on diffusion and also depending on whether the DA and the CA are friends or rivals. So basically whether they're divided or united. You may think, and this is actually what we'll find in a second, and I'll show you, that when the DA and the CAs are friends, so when the delivery agents and the other non-selected agents are friends, so when they're united, uh, there may be an incentive for the delivery agents to treat more farmers, to increase diffusion, and to reach more of the CA friends, of the CA ties. Instead, uh, if, if the DA and the CA is a rival, strategically, it could be the case that the delivery agent might instead treat fewer of their own friends to decrease diffusion and to avoid actually having an effect on the, 
uh, having you know a positive effect on the friends of the counterfactual agents. Obviously, this will only be the case in extreme situations where the DA and the CAs are really rival. And to do that, we are really going to think of politics because th having a different political affiliation is really what gets the most as rivalry in our context. So here, um, diffusion potential is measured with a share of farmers who discuss agriculture with fellow farmers at baseline. And actually what we find is consistent with what you would think, but that the percentage of untrained farmers who adopt techniques increases as the percentage of farmers who discuss agriculture at baseline increases. So if you have more farmers who discuss agriculture uh, at baseline, you're more in a situation where an untrained farmer is actually end up going to adopt technique, even if they were not directly trained by the delivery agents. I have this as a backup slide, but I don't have the time to show you this. I guess this is just the one slide I want to show you on this. Basically here, what we see is the following. We see first, I'm going to focus first on the right-hand side graph. We see that if you're in a community where the DA and the C are united, they belong to the same party. If you have more diffusion potential in the village, meaning people just talk more to each other about good agriculture, then the number of farmers that the delivery agent is going to train is going to increase with diffusion potential. And this is because eventually this is going to help reach more people. You know, it's going to help um, having more adoption in the community. And because here you care both about the DA ties, but also about the CA ties, you just have an incentive to train more people. Um, what we see is that you still train your own friends more, uh, but you do train more people on, on average um, in those villages. Instead, if you look at the effect of diffusion potential in villages where the DA and the CA are divided, when they're rivals, when they belong to different parties, we see exactly the opposite. So we see that when there is more diffusion potential, you actually train fewer of your friends. And the reason potentially you train fewer of your friends is if you want to prevent um, you know, the knowledge to diffuse to your rival friends uh, and to have an effect on them adopting more techniques. So this is just to say, you know, there does seem to be the case that the DA is internalized diffusion in some way. Um, if you're in an extreme situation where the DA and CA are kind of rivals, so they really belong to different parties, the way you react to diffusion potential uh, for, as, you know, on the side of the DA seems to be quite different. Um, to train more farmers um, if there is low diffusion potential um, in, um, uh, in the, when DA and, and C are divided. Okay, so I'm just going to conclude. I thought I thought I was you know um, uh, I was out of time, but actually uh, I was fine. So I'm just going to just wrap up uh, generally what I think this paper does. So villages are you know uh, you know that villages are exchange economies with rich social networks that involve both vertical and horizontal ties. And the goal of this paper is to study how local delivery is affected by these ties. And what we find is, you know, evidence consistent with this idea that having a tie between um, the agent and the beneficiary, so ver basically vertical ties can increase uh, the bias in the sense that the delivery agent is more likely to go to her friends, so it's likely to go to poorer farmers or to is more likely to go to more knowledgeable farmers, but more ties also increases adoptions. It basically motivates the delivery agents to train more people, and eventually this boosts up adoption. Now this trade-off, so the fact that vertical ties increases bias, but also increases adoptions, actually exists only when elites are divided. When elites are united, there is no role for social ties in our, in our results. So basically when, the, when elites are united, social ties simply don't matter. Uh, when elite instead are divided, and specifically when, when the two potential farmers are potentially rivals in the sense that they belong to different parties in our context, we actually see this strong trade-off between this strong trade-off. So really the delivery agents uh, focus exclusively on their friends uh, and not on the CA ties, and, and having more friends increases adoption. Another thing that we see is that this bias um, is stronger uh, when diffusion is low. Um, so when the lead are divided, the bias is much stronger when the future and when diffusion is low, uh, diffusion among farmers. So here I'm talking about horizontal ties among farmers. So overall, what this is saying is that both the vertical and the horizontal ties shape program delivery. All the results we find in this paper go through only when the elites are divided. So horizontal ties at the top seems to really matter. Um, 
just finally, as a final slide, um, you know, what this is saying is that local delivery where may require further adjustments. Um, uh, and one thing that it may require, uh, at least in those villages where the elites are divided, is to reduce the influence of social motives. And this can be done in a number of ways. You can increase pay, uh, or as Sudaya was, Sudeta was saying, you can make the incentive more aligned. Um, and you know, there is a paper showing this. You can professionalize local delivery agents uh, by you know, giving more career incentive if you, if you do perform exactly how the organization wants you to perform. So these are all things you can do. And there are a number of people looking at this. Now, the context we look at is a context with really low incentives. Uh, so this is something to consider. The other thing to consider is that you, as the organization, Brock could be considering adopting different recruitment criteria of delivery agents. Um, so this is something, you know, going to a comment that Young Hoon said, you know, gave me before. But here, so here, basically, what they do is that they recruit people, you know, who are central in the networks. They recruit elite farmers, basically, who tend to be more, uh, more knowledgeable uh, in terms of, you know, agricultural knowledge, but who also tend to have, you know, more connections. One option could be to hire actually a farmer who is maybe less knowledgeable and who has fewer connections. So within a village, it's not obvious that you should go for the elite farmer. Maybe you should go for someone else. Um, now, obviously, this leads to a trade-off that we can answer, which is the standard competence versus capture trade-off. Here, there is no variation in terms of who you hired uh, in terms of characteristics. So you all basically, Brax always goes for the elite farmer. But one question is whether actually going for the elite farmer is the ideal choice. Within our setting, this is the case. But for other studies, it would be interesting to know what is this case. And there is evidence uh, of this trade-off um, of this trade-off in the literature. Okay, so I think I will stop here um, with my last slide. And I wanted to thank you for, for the comment, especially those unbiased that will ask me to reflect on that. Thank you so much. Uh, can I just jump in with one question and then I'll open it to the floor? Uh, you know, we said in right in the beginning, we were saying there are multiple networks that are possible within a village, right? And so everything you're saying about these rivals, you're motivating it through political networks. And so if you just define your ties more broadly, then essentially what you're finding is that political ties are also important, not just social ties. So do we really need to go into the parochial altruism kind of explanation? Or is it just that you deliver to people with whom you have social ties and you also deliver to people with whom you have political ties? And, and the, the political rivals or the CA ties, when the, when the CA is your political rival, is like the antithesis of political ties. Those are the people with whom you do not have ties or you have yes. negative ties. What if there is such a... Yeah, I think you could, you could think of that. So you can think of, to some extent, positive, neutral, and negative tie, and the tie between, the, you know, when they're, when they're rivals, it's, it's kind of the negative ties. And when there is a negative ties at the top, so between these elite farmers, then you get that an entire part of the village is shunned. It's just kind of don't get the program at all. Um, and it could and be are, altruism. You know, sorry, sorry. Yes, you're right that the village is shunned or that part of the village is shunned, but it could, it, it could be that you want to hurt them or that you don't want to help them, which is the parochial altruism yeah. kind of story. But it could just be that you are such, you disagree so strongly that, you know, all this we were discussing about how it's less costly to talk to people who are your friends. It's much more costly to talk to your enemies. And so it's That's optimal to not offer them the program. Um. So you so that's absolutely right that it's more costly now whether it's optimal I think I need to rethink carefully about this bio thing uh, whether it's optimal or not um, I, so th this goes back to the misallocation uh, thing yeah, yeah. Um, uh, like I, I I get totally where you push me and you're totally right to push me that way so I need I need to think about this but so the last point I, I will need to think more carefully but otherwise abs uh, absolutely and actually absolutely to everything I just need to think more carefully about that Thanks. Point, but yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, questions so I had one other uh, question not not about misallocation but uh, something related which is the objective of the program itself uh, you know when it comes to new technologies quite often the returns 
are increasing with uh, land size. And so the objective of sort of technology policies, uh, should they be anti-poverty biased as well? Because, you know, if you, if you for instance, uh, I mean, you could act, okay, let me back up. Uh, this presumably under uh, utilization of new technology for lack of access uh, for whatever reason. And it's not clear whether that applies equally to all farmers in the village. If that is the case, if the most landed farmers obtain the highest value from the, uh, from the uh, access, then from a first best you know, objective of just maximizing total income in the village, uh, you would want to give it to the, to the biggest farmers. Uh, but it's possible also that the big farmers are, I mean, credit constraints, information constraints. The big farmers have enough credit and information. So that's not where the action is. The action is with the poor. Uh, and in that case, you want the program to be biased in favor of the poor. But I think that seems to be a fundamental question, which could easily be addressed by you know, another arm where you just offer the innovation randomly to people of varying levels of wealth and just see what their willingness to pay is or willingness yeah, to take up is. And that yeah, will help you at least, I mean, even BRAC needs, I think, needs to rethink this because sometimes, you know, we just want to everything to be anti-poor uh, without really thinking whether that's the right objective. So anyway, that's just- So I agree, uh, Deep, and actually b b back when we did the, pro the, the evaluation, this was a long discussion and BRAC is really, you know, on the women and the poverty thing, they're really a bit stubborn. Uh, now they have done a lot of studies on, you know, uh, on anti-poverty, as you know, you know, on varying this. But in Uganda, they were very stubborn. And in fact, what they say, this delivery agent, when when they train them, they really tell them, you should really give this program only to people who have less than half an acre of like that. They're really strong on the target the poors. Their goal is to push people to commercial. F so it seems like at least in Uganda, their goal is to push people from subsistence to from subsistence to commercial farming and the poorest one, rather than among commercial farmers expand you know their their profits and and this is kind of you know what they have in mind and and they and I think that you know I mean I. I Granted, that's their objective. It's a weird way of trying to achieve their objective by appointing elite farmers and asking them to yeah. select who, right? It's, I mean, then yeah, the yeah. selection of the agent, as you mentioned towards the end, is very important. Why, why do it's, you want to select exactly. the most? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, so in, in that sense, there is a trade-off because obviously the elite farmers are the only, so this the way these programs work, these localized program is that these guys receive like two weeks of training at the very beginning and then some, some training you know, over the months is, but you do need some people, someone who has some knowledge about techniques to train other people. Um, so another another way of doing this program would be to just hire someone random in the village, non-elite, and then to invest a lot more in training. Uh, uh, you know, this is more costly, whether it's cost effective, I don't know, but I think ultimately this is actually, actually we're working with Brock on, we're doing something similar. Um, in the using in that community health worker program, but it's exactly the same idea. They want to target the poorest household to get health services, and and basically they hired really elite women who know about health to provide these health services, which which may not be ideal. Um, but I think you know this is this is stuff to to you know to experiment on, and I don't have a, a clear idea of what's the best. But these are fundamental question questions. Do we have more questions? I had a comment. The, towards the end, there was a very interesting result that the quantity of treatment uh, is smaller when farmers talk more with each other, right? For the yeah. divided uh, villages. And yeah. I thought that was quite striking. And your explanation was kind of like, they don't want to treat people because they don't want the secrets to get to the other side or something like that. But I think it maybe is more likely that it's just a reflection of the degree of division in the village. That, you know, people talk to each other pretty freely. Maybe even though they're in different groups, the groups kind of get along. And so um, You're right, actually, it just I doesn't, it's just, it's the, you know, the being in a different party isn't as salient as a, 
I'm just thinking you're, other explanations. No, you're, I think you're totally right. Actually, I didn't think about this, but um, you are totally right. So let me actually write this down also because. Sorry, but have... in that connection, I was very curious about what this uh, variable means, the one that's on the x axis. It's not asking you how, when you say like 100%. It doesn't yeah. mean that all farmers are talking to all farmers. It just means 100% of farmers say they talk to somebody. Am I right about that? So you could all yeah. just be talking amongst yourselves in the little tiny group. Yeah, in that's right. Little, and I, yeah, that's right. But in the paper, we have different measures. So we also look at whether everyone talks. So we have different measures on you know, how many other fellow farmers. So here it's, okay, I don't remember which one we use here. I think it's with, if you talk with someone. Um, uh, so it's, it's, so it's not it's really saying. clear when you go from left to right that there's a lot more potential for diffusion here. It just means people like to talk, I think, to other uh, people. Yeah, but so we do see that, you know, if you're in a high village, if you're in a high diffusion, you do see that people who are not trained uh, are more likely to adopt the technique. So, they, so you know, there does seem to be a bad diffusion potential. I, do, I, I would need to remember exactly how we define this variable because we did it in a bunch of ways. And actually, if you do it with um, how many farmers, so we asked about a bunch of farmers, how, if you look at the average number of farmers they talk to something like this, it, we get something very similar. I so see. maybe okay. this is something yeah. more. Um, so let me just write this comment down because this part that was working. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, I think if that's the case, then Albert makes a really good point, right? Which is that yeah, exactly. maybe the, the, the agents are rival, but the farmers are happy to talk to each other. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, that's absolutely right. So I need to, I definitely need to discuss this. Okay, I'm writing this down. Fantastic. Sorry, I didn't have a piece of paper, so I'm writing on my phone on this side. It's a bit like... Um... I, I agree, this, this is a very interesting result, but I also wonder, I mean, the same party versus different party. I mean, Uganda, I thought, wasn't much of a real democracy. It's uh, pretty one-sided in favor of Museveni, right? So, uh, no, 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 it's actually no? there are going to be elections in a week. Uh, let's see. I know, I know. There are always elections right now, everywhere, but <laughs> no, no, but uh, right now it's really not clear he wins. But let's see, they always say this uh, and then he wins. Yeah, but uh, anyway, no, it's but, very uh, divided. No, it would be okay. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm sure there are enough in the, in the left uh, wing because that's driving your average results. So, yeah, yeah. so, so you must be right on that. I, yeah. But, the, this but is West uh, Uganda, the, these West villages Australia. could be fundamentally different in all kinds of different ways as well, right? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're giving one interpretation, but one always worries what it's correlated with. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we control for, like, again, we control for a bunch of things. And I think the most important one is political polarization, among, you know, in the, in the village. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, and we do control for that. This actually, it ended up not mattering too much. We, and we control for whatever, you know. We have a number of village infrastructure data. It, it, basically, I mean, we can add as much control as we have. I, I think the political polarization one is the most important one. Um, actually, the villages are, in our sample, uh, the 120 villages are shockingly similarly polarized. So this is a West, this is Western Uganda. It's, it's quite polarized. What we see is that it just so happens that in some villages, the elite is divided and the elite is united, but there doesn't seem to be very strong heterogeneity in the extent to which they polarize. Said this, you know, we control for how much, you know, how much things we can, uh, and we do have a number of controls, but it's hard to know if this is exhaust it's exhaustive. But this is an area of Uganda, I mean, the West Uganda, in fact, 51% support Museveni and 49 on average support FDC, which was the opposition in the previous election. So it's very divided. This is probably the area of Uganda which is the most divided. So it's was, you know, it's very stable. Um, yeah. More questions, comments? Okay, not seeing anybody. Um, so if we're done here, then. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll just thank Erica once again for a very, very interesting talk. 
Um, and thank you everybody for attending. We have, like I said before, one more to go, and that's now going to be on the 27th of January, um, Hong Kong time, which will probably be 26th in um, the US. Um, and yeah, it'll be in the middle of the night in Europe, so it's not gonna work for anybody. Else. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, we hope to see you all there as well. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much Erica. Everyone. Thank you. No, thank you so much for everyone, really. It was, it was great, thank you very much. Bye.